Hello, everybody, and welcome to our talk about embedded Linux security. So you might wonder why we're talking about this. This is Richard. So first start, who we are. This is Richard. He's a Linux kernel maintainer and developer. Uh, he does a lot of low-level stuff uh, on the kernel side and the user space side. My name is David. I did write a lot of software, and now I'm mostly looking at other people's software and try to fix or improve it. Um, and my focus is mainly security, cryptography, and everything around it. Still do engineering, but a bit less. Who we are is uh, we work for our company, which is mainly doing exactly that. We work with the embedded systems. Uh, we work on software engineering pro projects of all kind, and we do trainings and security. And in all that, uh, we mainly focus on embedded systems, Linux kernel topics, and security-wise, we do mostly yeah, everything from consulting in security down to looking at other people's code and finding bugs. We also do a lot of uh, contributions to open source uh, software projects and the kernel. And in all of that, especially embedded systems, we see a lot of security issues. And so we thought, let's talk about exactly that, what we see. And let's start with the good, then go through the bad, and then downhill towards the ugly. I'm going to start with the good part. So first of all, let's talk about why security for embedded systems. It's, it's been, in the early days, it was fun. You just built your system, and you didn't really have to care a lot about it. Nowadays, it's, it got worse, or it got better, basically, from a security point of view. We have a lot of compliance laws. We have GDPR, which is about privacy more. But uh, there's also the Cyber Resilience Act from the European Union. There's topics around NIS which might affect you. And there's also a lot of norms and, and policies which you have to follow, especially when you work in the industry and you manufacture devices for a broader uh, user base. And it can be business to customer or business to business. It really, yeah, there's a difference, but it, also the business to customer use case is, is getting a lot more attention these days. Yeah, and we all know, and I hope we all know, that hacking a corporate network or basically every network through embedded devices is a thing. It's real. It's printers, camera, whatever. Um, there's a ton of news about that in recent years. Um, just a few things that have happened, <laughs> but it's not all of it. Um, there are botnets in a lot of IoT devices. There's um, a constant stream of ob obvious or less obvious uh, bug, uh, bugs or security issues in routers, in firewalls, in cybersecurity products, basically. We, have, we had hacked cars just recently. We had um, a proof of concept how to hack a truck on the road uh, through Wi-Fi. And uh, they were able to, I think, slow it down or stop it completely. Uh, we have hacked household devices from your fridge down to your TV or whatever you have at home in your network. And also, fairly recently, uh, we got a lot more attention towards state-backed backdoors uh, into innocent things like compression libraries. Okay, let's start with the good things. We have Linux and embedded systems quite throughout every use case. And there's a lot of good things which we have. So embedded Linux today, um, we have a lot of great hardware out there. It's cheap. Uh, it's really um, fairly good available availability. Uh, we have board support packages uh, which support a lot of uh, systems, a lot of products, a lot of hardware. Uh, there's a huge community. We have fantastic tooling like the Yocto project. Debian runs on a lot of... Uh, ARM-based devices or other uh, systems. We have, going upwards the stack, we have BuildRoot, we have BusyBox, for example. We have Qt, which is supporting a wide range of GPUs or of, of uh, systems itself. So that's a fairly great stack. And the security-wise, we have a ton of features which are there, which are ready to use, which you just have to enable. Um, we can go through them fairly briefly because we're a bit short on time uh, to get through everything that's bad and ugly. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a bit 
quicker here. Uh, we have basic file system permissions, uh, we have ACLs, DAC, there's advanced file system permissions like mandatory ac access control, RBIC, MLS, there's file integrity, so you can make sure that your file is not changed uh, while your device shut, shut off or while your device is lying around and doing nothing. Um, there's stuff like IMA, EVM, uh, FS Verity, if somebody of, the, uh, of you heard of that. So your Android devices are using that, for example. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, cryptography in there as well. So the Linux kernel itself has a great security uh, crypto API. They have a wide range of uh, implementations ready available. You can also use them from user space. Um, we have strong encryption and authentication of your storage. So that's the whole device mapper stuff. There's the mcrypt, the mverity, uh, the mintegrity, for example, no, also. We have the um, trust boot, secure boot, or whatever you want to call it, verified boot uh, chain, where you can really boot a device and ensure that cryptography, uh, cryptography uh, fully ensure that from the start of your device till your user space application starts, uh, everything is authenticated by you, and nothing else is allowed to run, if you do it right. Uh, we have a, a ton of randomization, so there's uh, address space layout randomization, uh, randomized kernel heap, uh, we have stuff like uh, namespaces, which is the whole container use case too, but also there's sandboxing technologies like SecComp, which you can use for other use cases as well. You don't have to use containers. So basically it's all good, right? Um, we have all these technologies there, we can just use them. They're in every kernel, basically, if you have a recent kernel. <laughs> um, but that's not it. You need to use them properly, and that's not always easy. There's a lot of documentation, there's a lot of things you have to know, of edge cases which you have to consider. And at best, you get a secure platform, so your basic OS and board support package is secure. It, have, it brings all the features. And if you're, if you're really lucky, they're all enabled by default. But you can still poke a lot of holes into that secure system by your own application running on top of it. Right? So as soon as you open a network port, um, you have to make sure that it's shut down or that it's basically secured, that nobody else can ex access it, or that you cannot do anything evil with it or uh, exploit it and run some malicious code on there. So that's the, the hard part. And even innocent looking technical issues could be uh, the cause for a major vulnerability down the road. For example, um, when you build your application, usually your, if you talk about uh, the Yocto project, for example, they already have great compiler flex configured for you, so you can build your application uh, with them. But if you start overwriting them, you could miss uh, that you have to Extend, uh, append your compiler flex to them and not override them. Because otherwise you disable some warnings uh, which might be security relevant for you. Also, you, you might have an application which depends on legacy libraries. A great example for this, which we are seeing quite often, is OpenSSL. OpenSSL moved to version 3, I think, now. Um, and we still see applications which depend on 1.0 or even lower. Which are outdated, which are not updated anymore, which are basically vulnerable. And if your application does not support recent versions because the API changed in between, then uh, you have a problem because you have to stick uh, to the old version unless you start updating. And there's also things like um, if your application is not 64-bit uh, safe or doesn't support 64-bit, you might miss out on some security features. St you you cannot use the NX bit, uh, you might not be able to use the full range of ASLR which the kernel gives you. And also, I mean, that's basically probably not that innocent, but uh, if your application runs this route, you're giving your potential attacker already free privilege es escalation. And that should be obvious, and still people do it. <laughs> okay, so I already, already gave you a bit of a a few what's of what's coming, but Richard is going through the bad things uh, which we see, and then we're gonna continue on to onwards to the ugly things. It's basically a, gonna be a high-level overview and not very much detail, 
because we're short on time. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Now let's talk about the bad things. Since David told us that everything is nice and shiny, and I will say no. The problem is with security features is that many of them depend on the on hardware features. For example, verified boot. When you want to make sure that a specific piece of software can only run on your hardware, you have to have support for verified boot, and verified boot is is highly hardware spe hard specific specific or also lesser known disk encryption. When you have an embedded device and use full disk encryption, um, you need to store somewhere the password because you cannot ask the user every time to enter a password when you when you boot up your your embedded device. But how can you store a password on the embedded device that the embedded device itself can read it at boot up, but the attacker cannot extract it? This is something that is usually solved using secure elements, and these are highly hardware specific. But um, the thing is that these hardware specific um, features uh, need a special driver in the kernel. You have to know how you you can utilize them, and some of them are well written, some of them are not well written. And when the driver is buggy, then the attacker can still extract the key, for example. So we have seen many bad drivers out of tree, and we actually found some drivers they were really vulnerable, where we f found ways to extract the key. So and that's one of the points we want to we want to stress out. Just because the hardware has this nice feature doesn't mean it's good and easy to use. You have to be very sure that the, the software part is also good. This is a common source of pain in in both support packages. Another ugly part is the or the bad part is the permission thing. David said already um, when the application runs as root you already give an attacker free privilege escalations. Sadly, we see this often in the wild. The, the application from the vendor that runs on an embedded device can only work when it runs as root. Because during development, nobody cared, and, and later they had no time to figure out um, how to break down the permissions or what files needs to be accessed. And as soon as your application has a tiny security issue, and somebody can inject code, the attack has already root permissions, and that's really bad. Another thing is backends. These days, almost every embedded device talks to do a cloud, a backend. So the, the backend is also part of your whole product. What is when your backend is vulnerable? And the backends these days are really complicated, and they have to offer a lot of um, attack surface. For example, we've recently learned that in in Australia, um, the power grid operator requires you to to shut down your your embedded d device um, when there is a problem in the power grid, and you have to support that as vendor. Otherwise, you cannot so you cannot um, um, sell a photovoltaic um, device in Australia. Now you have to offer a backend with this feature and have to make sure only the power grid vendor can use this feature and not the, the bad guys. And when you have a, a bug in this field, then the game is over. What also bad is often is the, um, the software development lifecycle. Often the, the, software the, the software itself is written really poorly and nobody followed secure coding um, principles or even some don't know all their dependencies. Think of supply chain attacks. So when I ask you, do you know in detail from what software components your application de depends on? I get seldom a good answer. Or even knowing about resources. When you don't know how much CPU power or memory your application knows, how can you limit it? These days on embedded devices you often use container technologies and you also want to limit the resources that you can, can manage. My device has only one gigabyte of memory, but I have to run four applications. How make I sure that, that all of them four applications have enough memory? Or even knowing which files do I have to read and which files do I have to write? 
when you don't know this, you can always run the application only with full root permissions. This all sounds not trivial, but in reality, that's really hard to figure out when you have a, an, an old application and nobody knows anymore. If you don't know the, 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 the real requirements, you cannot create a good sandbox or, for example, write a good um, SE Linux policy. And then you fall back to, okay, I have to run everything as root. Also, what's also often bad is, is the, the testing and certification. So you need, of course, a good QA. You need somebody that has to, to look at and pro deep, get an, get an external audit of the code from time to time. It's not because we need money, it's, it's more because you need a fresh a, a pair of eyes. So usually we ask stupid questions and while asking then people will realize, oh, there's something we have forgotten. Also production. As I said before, when you have um, disk encryption, you have to store a disk encryption key on your device. How, how do you deploy this key? For example, when you use for every de device out there the very same disk encryption key, because doing production, you're just cloning the device always. And one attacker is able to hack one device and figures out one disk encryption key. He has a disk encryption key for every device out there. Same applies for trivial things like the, like the root password. When you, when you add, for whatever reason, a root password on your device and somebody figures out what the root password is, and you have the very same everywhere, then you're maybe in trouble. So always de design your, your device in a mind that the attacker will be able to completely reverse it and learn all the secrets. And you have to make sure that he can, can only harm himself, but not the other devices. As I said before, at the at deployment time, um, the device will be in the hands of your enemies and they will figure out. So don't trust the device, especially when the device is talking to, to the cloud, for example. When the attacker can log in into your device and talk to your backend, uh, and the backend allows everything, you are again in trouble. This is here in bold font, in bold font so please really make sure that you don't have identical secrets on all the devices because the attacker has time and they will figure out some, some when. That's what the bad part. Now let's briefly talk about the ugly part. So usually when you create an embedded device, this is a lot of work and it's hard, but the sad truth is the, the really hard part is maintaining. So when you have to, to maintain your device, for example, five or 10 years, there's a lot of work. Because um, you have to make sure that the, that the device is getting all the security updates or the, the updates from your vendor. Or even you have to make sure that the, that the hardware you're using is available for 10 years. When the, when the hardware is changing every two years, you have to make sure that your software can deal with many types of hardware. But let's focus now on, on software. So when you have your, your Linux system, it's all working, it's all nice, it's all shiny, but now your boss tells you, okay, now make sure it works for 10 years. And by the way, if there's a security fix, fix it for the next 10 years. Easy job. Not really. So but there are basically two options. You can always upgrade your, de your dependencies. For example, um, as David said before, OpenSSL. Every time when OpenSSL does a new release, you just go to this new release, then you can be sure that you get all the security fixes. There's, a, there's, a, there's also the approach what many Linux distributions use, for example, Chengdu or Arch Linux. Or you say, no, I want to stay with the, with the version I have because it works best with my application and I will just backport all the security fixes. This is, for example, what does um, SUSE Enterprise Linux or Red Hat Enterprise Linux. They stay for many years on the very same version and do just backporting of fixes. Or the, the most popular option, do nothing. Don't do that. <laughs> you have to say that. Okay, yeah, don't do that. I thought it's obvious, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So let's look at more detail in the always upgrade approach. Because that's mm, tempting. For example, when you use Yocto, you just always use the, the, the latest and greatest Yocto release. They release every eight months. They have also long-term support for four years. So in 10 years, when you use an, an LTS, you have to upgrade maybe two, maybe three, three times, all easy. But the problem is when you upgrade to a new release, then the, the programming API will change. And we, when your application can only work, for example, with, with Qt version 5, and all of a sudden Yocto moves to Qt version 6, then you have to talk to your boss, okay, now we have to change the application and move it to Qt 6. And the boss will either say, okay, let's do it, or say, nope, we have no time and no budget. Same for OpenSSL or whatever library that's non-trivial. That's a major pain of source, because when the, your application is poorly written, you cannot easily upgrade. When your application is well written, then you can easily upgrade. But you have to really understand and know your dependencies. For example, um, OpenSSL changed their, their API massively um, from the version 1.0 to, to 1.1. And it broke many applications because many applications did use um, OpenSSL internal function calls, which are, which are not supposed to be used. But the developers at that time just used it. And then OpenSSL did a major cleanup, and everything broke. And many applications had to be more or less rewritten. And when you don't have the budget for that, or even don't know that, then you're in trouble. And you cannot just upgrade all the versions. And of course, when you always use the latest and greatest stuff, there's a, a big chance that you gain new bugs. So when you just move from Qt 5 to Qt 6, you then will get shiny new bugs that only exist in Qt 6. So keep that in mind. So here's the, is the QA cycle really important. You have to have a, a good QA team that is able to find out did the new version broke something or not. That's why many say, okay, let's stay safe. We don't upgrade, we just look out and touch, just backport all the security fixes, that's easy. Because this can, can Red Hat do with 100 people and I can do it, do it alone, so easy business. The thing is, even if you're following all CVEs, you have to figure out where do I get the bug fix for my version and does the bug fix apply to my version? For example, when they found a super critical bug, bug in OpenSSL version 3, then you will get a bug fix for version 3. How can you know that this bug fix works on your version 1.0? Maybe the patch even, even applies and you're lucky, but maybe the patch doesn't make any sense. And then you have to understand the security issue in detail and build the bug fix for your own. And there's a lot of work, and you have to understand the, the, the dependencies really well. And that's hard. That's really hard. That's actually why SUSE Enterprise or Red Hat wants money for their distributions, because they do this a lot, and this takes time and experts. And now let's talk about the elephant, the kernel. Usually when you buy a new piece of hardware, you get a a kernel from your board support package, so if your, your vendor, for example, NXP or the Access Instruments gives you a kernel, they say, oh, that's our kernel, we've patched it, it, it runs with our board, all easy. But usually, their kernels are in bad shape. They are just an, an old version and they will not provide you updates. So you cannot use a shiny new kernel version for kernel.org. And this is the problem that, that many people are just using the, the kernel and also the, the bootloader from the Borderbot package, stay with that old kernel and cannot upgrade. Because they say, when we upgrade your new kernel from kernel.org, we miss all the customizations. Because the, the, the vendor implemented many strange drivers, they had to change something and we don't understand that. So you, then you're stuck on the old kernel and you cannot fix security issues in the kernel. That's why the, the kernel is usually a, a big problem, and we always stress our clients to, to, to extract the changes from the Borderbot package, understand the changes, and then reapply them to a mainline kernel. Because then you can upgrade when you know I just need this driver and that change, and you can always update 
or massage the change and make it work with the newest kernel. Then you are untangled from the bottom of the package. If you don't do that, you end up in a security nightmare. And I know some customers, some customers they, they are still forced to, to run kernel 2.6. Because they say they have no way to upgrade to a new kernel. They don't understand that the changes. And when they make a diff between the, the kernel version from the vendor and the mainline version, then a, then a diff has a, has a size of a few megabytes. OK, we are now at the end. So we have now five minutes for, for questions. So I will skip that slide, keep track of CVEs, but the hope is, is not lost. Try to use something like, like Debian as space if possible, because then they will do the hard work for you. Then you have just a kernel, understand your patches, and keep everything in shape. And don't tie yourself to a specific hardware. Make your software update data. Summary, it's not bad, but Keep in mind you understand your dependencies. So that's it, and I hope there are some questions. I'm sorry for stressing, I've overlooked the time. Is there a question? There's one in, in front row. Do you have an idea why it is so difficult for hardware vendors to just use a mainline kernel, to just use Debian as a base? I mean, most of them run some version of Debian in there, which is like 10 years old. But if I, I, I use one of these Star 5 boards, I mean, they have a Debian kernel heavily customized, hard to compile yourself. Why do they do that? Because they give a shit. The problem is. <laughs> Yeah, the problem is um, they, they have really skilled guys, but this, this guy gets no time budget to, to write a nice and well-shaped driver. He just has, has to get the hardware work in some way, and when he wants to upstream the driver, the kernel maintainers say, oh my god, this just works by chance, no way, go away. Yeah. So mainlining, mainlining patches is really hard work. It takes a lot of time, because you have to get your patches in shape. You have to write nice code. You have to write code that's maintainable. And, and that's portable. often the issue. And portable, and that's often the issue. Unfortunately. But it's getting better there. The these has many vendors, they really enforce upstream, so it's way better than 10 years ago. There's a question in the back row. Have you maybe got some hardware uh, recommendation for some company which uh, pays more attention to this? Um, single power computers, mostly, would be my question. Yeah, for example, these days, um, Renesas or NXP, they are not that bad. But it depends on what hardware features you need. They, they have still their own vendor trees that have special drivers that are not upstream. But for example, for NXP, you have a good chance that the mainline kernel will boot as is. Also, you can look at the mainline kernel itself, because it, it will you will see configurations and device trees for devices which are supported mainline. But it depends on your specific features which you're using. NXP has mainlined a lot of things, but very small subsystems might not be mainlined. You have to still use their vendor kernel for that. Yeah. One of the best bad examples is, for example, Raspberry Pi. They have a completely forked kernel. They, give, they don't care, care much. And their kernel is a nightmare. Is that a question? No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, then thanks for your attention and thank you.